excellent singing. You've done well. Be seated if you would. Turn to the book of Hezekiah in your Bible. The book of Hezekiah. Find that if you would. The book of Hezekiah. For those of you who are talking, don't give it away. Hezekiah, if you would. Now... For those who are looking for the book of Hezekiah, there is no such book as Hezekiah. (laughs) Just uh, wanted you to uh, try to figure it out. How about the book of Isaiah? How about the book of Isaiah? Is there such a book as Isaiah? Yeah, there is. All right, go ahead, Quinn, hit the button there, buddy. There we go, so that's what we're talking about today. Isaiah 38, if you would, Isaiah 38. So now, I can't use that one on you for a while, uh, book of Hezekiah. So I just want to read one verse, and then we're going to turn to some other passages as we go through the message here today. Matter of fact, I just want to read the first part of verse 17, Isaiah 38, verse 17. Behold, for peace... I had great bitterness. Behold, for peace, I had great bitterness. What a quote and what a passage that we're going to look at this morning is going to reveal a tremendous secret uh, to us that uh, uh, hopefully will be a blessing. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word today. Thank you for this passage and what we're going to study here today. I pray it'll be a blessing and encouragement to us, instruction as well. And uh, Lord, it'll edify us in our faith and in, in our walk with you. If there's somebody here that needs to be saved today, I pray that uh, certainly this would be the day of salvation in their heart and in their life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Most of you, uh, all of you, I guess, have heard of President Ronald Reagan. President Reagan uh, always had a sunny, optimistic perspective on life. If you uh, would look around and remember his life. With him, it was always morning in America. And he would say, win one for the Gipper. Uh, You know, he was uh, shot. Somebody tried to assassinate him, but he had even a positive attitude uh, toward that. Uh, He had such a positive attitude that during his presidency, of course, the Berlin Wall came tumbling down, amongst other things. Where in the world did his optimistic spirit come from? Where did he get his perspective on life and his outlook on life? Well... If you study his life, you read his biographies, it came from his mother, from his mother. His mother was Nell Christian Reagan, tremendous Christian lady. One of her favorite books was The Christian Secret of a Happy Life by Hannah Whittle Smith. And the theme of that book is this. God will let little befall you that will not be to the ultimate benefit of your soul. Let me say that again. God will let little befall you that will not be to the ultimate benefit of your soul. And of course, we know the scripture that goes along with that. Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to them that love God. So her philosophy was whatever happens to God's children will be used for good in their lives. And in one of the autobiographies of President Reagan, uh, an example is given. He graduated from a Christian college in northern Illinois, and he started looking for a job. But it just so happened that it was during the Great Depression and jobs were hard to find. He He hitchhiked to Chicago, but he had no luck. So he came back home to Dixon, Illinois, and he found out that a Montgomery Ward store was getting ready to open in his hometown. He said, man, I'm going to go apply for a job. uh, they, They were looking for someone to run the sports department. 
And so he was 22 years old at the time. He thought, man, I'm the perfect candidate. Of course, you know, in college he had played football. He was a lifeguard. He was a, a very uh, athletic type guy. Uh, and um, they were willing to pay him $12.50 a week to run the sports department at Montgomery Ward. He said, that's exactly what I need to help my family. So he applied for the job, but somebody else got it. And he was crushed. So he went and told his mom of his disappointments. And she had a little talk with him. And she told him that all things were part of God's plan, even the most disheartening setbacks. If something went wrong, we shouldn't grow discouraged or feel down in the dumps. We should trust God with it and keep going. Later on, she told him that something good would happen and you'd find yourself thinking later on, if I hadn't had that problem back then, then this better thing would not have happened to me. So he just believed what his mama said. It came from his mama and his mama's Bible. Well, not soon after, a local radio station hired him for $75 a week to broadcast sports. And of course, he actually broadcast uh, football games and other things. Soon his name was known throughout the Midwest. That was the first step on the path that led him into broadcasting, movies, mm -hmm. politics, and all the way to the White House. Now, what if Ronald Reagan had been hired at Montgomery Ward? You or I would have probably never heard his name. He would not probably have ever made it to the White House. But that was a crushing blow to him at the time. But his mama reassured him of the things of God and what God had to say about that. Well, in our story here today, in Isaiah, I said, you, I said to turn to the book of Hezekiah because our story today is about another man, a statesman, a king by the name of Hezekiah. He's the one that quoted what we have here in Isaiah chapter 38 and verse number 17, where he said, for peace, I had great bitterness. Those are the very words of King Hezekiah himself. Now, as we think about that verse, it reminds us of James chapter 1. And if you were with us a few months ago, earlier in the year, I, I preached a series of messages from James chapter 1. We went all the way through the chapter, from chap verse 1 all the way down to the end, verse 27, I think, or 29. Anyhow, we went all the way down to the end. And of course, James says to count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations or when you fall into various trials, to count it all joy. Hezekiah here said in Isaiah 38, 17, for peace I had great bitterness. In other words, uh, uh, it was for my benefit that I suffered anguish. It was for my own good that I had trouble in my life. That's what he's talking about here. He, he's basically saying, it was for my own good that I had a hard time at a certain time in my life. That's what he's talking about right here. I think we can learn a lot from Hezekiah's story and from the fact that he said, for peace... I had great bitterness, or for peace, I had great trial in my life. So who was this Hezekiah man, this fellow? Who was he? What was he, and again, what was he talking about? What bitterness and anguish did he suffer? And what can we learn today from his bitterness and anguish and his attitude toward his bitterness and anguish in his life? I just finished reading again uh, through 2 Chronicles, and the story of Hezekiah, again, is very uh, prominent in 2 Chronicles. And let me tell you, Hezekiah was a great king. He was one of the good kings of Judah. His father, King Ahaz, was one of the bad kings of Judah. 
But King Hezekiah was one of the greatest kings. Uh, we know about him from 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles, and now here in the book of Isaiah. You see, Isaiah was a prophet during the same time that Hezekiah was king. So they knew each other and knew each other well. And so that's why we have this story here in the book of Isaiah. Let me tell you, Hezekiah brought spiritual revival to Judah. They had not had spiritual revival for a while, but Hezekiah brought great reforms and there was great joy in the land. He was 25 years old when he became king of Judah. And again, he sought from the very beginning to change things in the land of Judah. And uh, he launched repairs on the temple. Uh, they, it had been neglected and run down. And uh, he reestablished the worship of the Lord. He fixed the temple and reestablished the worship of the Lord. Second Chronicles 29, don't turn there, but it says, So the service of the house of the Lord was set in order. And Hezekiah rejoiced, and all the people that God had prepared the people for the thing was done suddenly. He reinstituted the feast of the Passover. Great spiritual things were going on in Judah, a revival in essence. The nation had been turned back to the goodness and grace of God. And would it not be good if we could see that kind of revival in America today? King Hezekiah. Right in the middle of his reign, however, right at the peak of his manhood, the pinnacle of his usefulness, Hezekiah was struck from nowhere by twin disasters. One was a military disaster and one was a medical disaster. Now, if you study this story, it's very interesting to see, but both of these disasters happened when Hezekiah was 39 years old. He was 25 when he started reigning. And in the age of 39, he had a military disaster and a medical disaster. Turn back just to chapter 36 of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 36. And I want you to see verse number 1. Isaiah 36, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the 14th year of King Hezekiah that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the defense cities of Judah and took them. All right, so if Hezekiah was 25 when he took over and this is the 14th year of his reign, again, how old would he be? 39 years old. All right, go back to chapter 38. Go back to chapter 38. And verse number 1 this time. Verse number 1. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. All right, and it says in those days. So what days are we talking about? Well, we're talking about the days of the invasion by Sennacherib, the king of Assyria. All right, now... For the sake of, of establishing a chronology here, let me jump ahead of the story. Hezekiah was sick unto death here in chapter 38. He cried out to God and he asked God to preserve his life and to give him more time. And of course, uh, we even hear today, apparently, uh, 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 Miss Joe's uh, niece has been granted more time. Uh, and, and there's been uh, some of uh, you and some of folks that we know that, uh, you know, we prayed for God to heal them. God didn't heal them. And we prayed for God to heal them and God did heal them. That's God's business, okay? That's not our business, but that's God's business. All right, so we know that. Well, Hezekiah prayed and, and, and of course, God uh, extended his life by 15 years. Now, again, you study the chronology of Hezekiah's life. He died when he was 54. So if you take those extra 15 years, you deduct those from 54, what do you got? You got 39. So in the age of 39 years old, Hezekiah had these, these double whammies in essence. He had a military disaster and he had a medical disaster come upon him. Both in the same year at the age of 39. A one-two punch. He was facing a tremendous enemy 
attacking the land. As a king and as a man, he was facing his own mortality. He was sick unto death. Now, I think it's kind of interesting to think about this. That sometimes it seems like problems come in one, I mean in twos or threes even. Is it not true that uh, um, sometimes uh, you hear of somebody you know dying and before you know it, you hear of somebody else you know is dying? It's kind of a one-two punch. We've, we've even talked about it in, in, in triplicate. You know, it seems like there's going to be three uh, things uh, going on. Well, you know, about the time, uh, you know, you have one tragedy or one trouble in your life, all of a sudden there's another that comes up. Uh, 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 um, you know, it's like the one-two punch or, again, the double whammy or double trouble or some people say double, double toil and trouble. Have you ever made this statement? I'm just sitting around here waiting for the next shoe to drop. That's kind of a cliche, but it's the idea of, man, I'm just waiting for the next trouble to come into my life. It seems like I'm in that kind of uh, a pattern uh, uh, right now. Of course, it's happened in our church just here in the last few months, the Jenkins family. They had one death. And this, a couple of weeks later, had another. Two sons died within a couple of weeks of each other. And then, of course, uh, uh, Reuben got hurt and had to go to the doctor, and then they found out they got, he's got a mass on his kidney that they're still checking out. You talk about uh, trouble after trouble after trouble. It, it's happened. Even Roy and Brenda Durhammer. You know, Roy's got plenty of health issues, and then... Uh, uh, Brenda went back to the doctor the other day and found out her cancer had come back. And so they're dealing with that. Many of you remember Mary Brown in our church. And Mary Brown's uh, dear husband, Sam Brown, died. One of the, uh, just a tremendous man, a big part of our church in the early days. And uh, within two months, Mary had also bur buried her son, her only son. It was just a, a double whammy. And so why is this? Why, why, do, why do these things seem to come in pairs or even uh, uh, trios? You know, why does it seem to, to happen that way? Well, if, if you stop and think about it and you study the scriptures, you realize that sometimes it can very well be a strategic assault by Satan himself. Uh, by the devil himself. Whenever we suddenly encounter a string of problems or distresses, uh, sometimes you can see the lurking hand of the devil. Satan has something to do with it. And I'll give you a Bible story. Job. Job. Man, I tell you, Job uh, heard some bad news about, uh, you know, his, his cattle. And then he heard some more bad news about this. And he heard some more bad, I mean, just boom, 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 boom. Bad news after bad news after bad news. And he found out all of his children got killed. And then his health deteriorated. It was one thing after another, a blitzkrieg like. Uh, uh, you've heard of the, the World War II uh, uh, German Luftwaffe. How they would uh, carpet bomb or cluster bomb, I guess is the term. And, and they would just kind of bomb and then turn right around and come right back and bomb again and come right back and bomb again. Uh, that's kind of the idea. And of course, uh, uh, Satan was the one uh, with God's permission, of course, that, uh, that uh, went after Job. It's amazing to think about. So sometimes we see the devil, of course, uh, 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 causing us grief in our life and causing us trouble. But also, I think when we, when we see ourselves under these assaults, like we see Hezekiah right here, we, we must understand that they may very well represent the attacks of the devil, but they also will represent the lessons of the Lord. The lessons of the Lord. See, when you become a Christian, you become a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and disciple, of course, means learner. You're, you're a learner. And the Lord wants to teach us lessons every day of our life. No matter what goes on in our life, listen to me, the Lord wants to teach us lessons, even during the hard times. And sometimes that's where we can learn the most. 
and learn the best. But see, the Lord knows we're very unstable pupils. Is it not true that we find ourselves sometimes very hot for the Lord and then the next time uh, we really examine ourselves, we find ourselves kind of lukewarm or even cold? Man, we're hot on, on fire for the Lord one minute and not so hot the next minute. We, we find ourselves full of faith one minute and the, and the next moment we're, we're wavering in our faith. We're overcome with worry and fear. One minute we're obedient to the Lord and the next minute we, we found that we have failed Him. John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace, wrote this poem. He wrote a lot of songs and a lot of poems. We, we know him for amazing grace, but I want you to listen to this poem that he wrote. He, it's, it's called Conflicting Feelings. And it's kind of like Paul, you know, when Paul said, the things I want to do, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, those are things I do. And he said, it's driving me crazy. Listen to what John Newton said. He said, strange and mysterious is my life, what opposites I feel within, a stable peace, a constant strife. Imagine that. a stable peace, but a constant strife. The rule of grace, the power of sin. Too often I am captive led, yet daily triumph in my head. I prize the privilege of prayer, he said, but oh, what backwardness to pray. Though on the Lord I cast my care, I feel its burden every day. I seek his will in all I do, Yet find my own is working too. I call the promises, the promises of God, he said, I call the promises my own and prize them more than mines of gold. Yet though their sweetness I have known, they leave me unimpressed and cold. One hour upon the truth I feed, the next I know not what I read. While on my Savior I rely, I know my foes shall lose their aim. And therefore dare their power defy, assured of conquest through his name. But soon my confidence is slain, and all my fears return again. Thus different powers within me strive, and grace and sin by turns prevail. I grieve, rejoice, decline, revive, and victory hangs in doubtful scale. But Jesus has his promise passed that grace shall overcome at last. I mean, it's, 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 it's like we're, uh, uh, again, up one minute and down the next, and how true it is. Well, the Lord wants to develop us, and He wants to stabilize us and strengthen us, and that's one of the reasons why trials have to come into our lives. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, well, I, sure like, I would sure like to have a medical disaster today. <laughs> I'd sure like to have my car break down today. Nobody gets up and says that. Again, go back to Job. The things that Job endured were sent by the devil, but allowed by the Lord. Think about that. Satan wanted to use these things to tear down Job's faith, but the Lord used them to build up Job's faith and make him twice the man he was before. And again, that's what trials do. See, that's the same thing as Hezekiah. After Hezekiah had gone through these two terrible trials, see, King uh, Sennacherib of Assyria was getting ready. He, was, he, he wanted to wipe out Judah. And then, later on that year, Hezekiah is laying on his deathbed. Same year. Tremendous trials. But later on in life, what did he say? He said what it says in Isaiah 38, 17. Behold, for peace I had great bitterness. It was for my benefit. It was for my peace. It was for my good that I had to go through these things. And it, and it, was, it was terrible to go through at the time, but God taught me His great lessons of love and power and strength. Now what, what did Hezekiah learn? What did Hezekiah learn? Go back to chapter 36. Go back to chapter 36. 
What did Hezekiah learn? I want you to see this in Isaiah 36. We're going to read down through verse 4 this time. Now it came to pass in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, he was 39 years old, that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the defense cities of Judah and took them. And the king of Assyria sent Rabshakeh from Lachish to Jerusalem unto King Hezekiah with a great army. And he stood by the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. Then came forth unto him Eliakim, Hilkiah's son, which was over the house, and Shebna the scribe, and Joah, Asaph's son, the recorder. And Rabshakeh said unto them, this Assyrian said unto them, Say ye now to Hezekiah. Thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria. And here it is, folks. What confidence is this wherein thou trustest? What confidence is that in that you trust? Now, what was the confidence of Hezekiah? Was it his great army? Was it his intelligence and, and, and bravery? Uh, uh, was it his uh, military skills? No. What was the confidence that Hezekiah had? It was in the Lord, right? In the Lord. So here is this pagan, pagan man coming and said, I hear you got some confidence in something. Hardy, hardy, hard. Ha, ha, ha. Look at this big army out here. We're getting ready to wipe you out. What kind of confidence do you really have? Who you got your confidence in, buddy? Look at verse 5. I say, this is Rabshika, or Rabshika, keep on talking. He says, I say, sayest thou, but they are but vain words. I have counsel and strength for war. Now, on whom? Dost thou trust that thou rebellest against me? Here is what happens in every one of our lives. We have trouble in our life. The devil, in the person of Rabshakeh, comes and he says, Who are you trusting? What you got your confidence in? Who are you leaning on? Um, you leaning on yourself? And of course, they were making a mockery of God. He'll even come along and say, and you'll even tell the devil, I said, well, I'm leaning on God. And he'll say, <laughs> it don't look like he's helping you right now. Don't look like he's, it looks like he's forgotten you right now. Looks like he don't love you anymore right now. Why, why do you have your confidence in him? He's nobody to put your confidence in. That's what the Assyrians were telling old King Hezekiah. Getting ready to wipe him out. Now, Hezekiah, of course, didn't face this alone. He had a friend by the name of Isaiah. Isaiah just happened to be a great prophet of God. And Isaiah told him, he said, in quiet, quietness and confidence shall be your strength. Now, we're not going to turn there, but I'm going to tell you that Hezekiah, of course, again, had his confidence in God. And I'm going to tell you, let me, let me read to you what he said to them, what he said to the people of, of Judah after Assyria showed up on their border. It's 2 Chronicles 32. It says, He set captains of war over the people and gathered them together to him in the street of the gate of the city, and he spake comfortably to them, saying, Be strong and courageous. Be not afraid nor dismayed for the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude that is with him. For there be more with us than with him. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. Hezekiah, this great godly man, had, I guarantee you he had gone back and he had uh, read 
Some of the things that even his great, 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 great grandfather, King David said, Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes come upon me to eat my flesh, they stumble and fell. And though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. He said this, I had fainted unless I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. You know, the Bible says, blessed is a man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. See, the Bible also tells us the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do to me. And, and we need to be strong and be of good courage. Now, guess what Assyria ended up doing? Losing, dying, going back home with a whole lot less people. And let me tell you something, God took care of the situation for them. And, uh, and, and of course, Hezekiah had that confidence or that faith, that trust in God during his, the toughest times of his life. These, these back-to-back tough times. This double whammy, this one-two punch that had come into his life. He continued to have confidence in God. And folks, I've been doing this a long time. When I started this, I had hair. And I had brown hair. Now I, what hair I do have is all white, I guess. Not even gray, it's white. Let me tell you something. I've, I've learned a lot of things through the years, but one thing I've learned that God values faith and confidence in Him above all else in our hearts. When we are in the midst of trouble and trial, that we, we, uh, we step out of the boat like Peter did and we begin to walk on water and, and, and you know, Peter started looking around. Well, we're not going to look around. We're going to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. And we're going to have confidence and faith and trust in Him. That's what Hezekiah did. That's what Hezekiah did. And the Bible gives us a verse about that too. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. You want to please God in your life? You've got to have a boatload full of faith in Him, even in the toughest of times. That you just have. He is your confidence. He is your quietness. Listen, the Lord allows trials in our life to build up that confidence. Amen. To build up that assurance. To build up that quietness in our souls. We don't have to be anxious. We don't have to be angry. We can have that confidence and faith in the Lord. King Hezekiah, let me tell you something. He started out day one, changed the nation for God. He was living a charm life, a life of revival and blessing until all of a sudden he turned 39. And boy, I mean, it went south in a hurry for him. His land was invaded by the enemy. His body was invaded by disease. Both came uh, at the same time in a simultaneous attack. And again, multiple problems and perils, sometimes represent an attack by Satan. But God can always use whatever happens in our life to deepen our faith, our trust, establish our confidence, and so blessing in our lives so we can say this, surely it was for my benefit that I did this. As Hezekiah said, for peace. In my heart and in my life, I had great bitterness. I had great anguish. I had a hard time. But on the back side of that, I had peace and confidence and trust. And I saw, he didn't know Romans 8, 28 in that sense yet, but he saw truly that all things work together for good to them that love God. Think about your life. 
Where would you be today if some of the things that God had said no to in your life, where would you even be today? Who knows? God allows trials, trouble. He doesn't give us everything we want, you know. We, we, we want our prayers answered the way we want them right now, right? Yep. Let me tell you something. Be glad. And later on, you're going to say, boy, I sure am glad God didn't answer that prayer. <laughs> uh, really, God did answer it. He just said no. But you understand what I mean. I, he didn't answer it the way I wanted it answered. Just trust in Him. Know that He knows what's best, right? And He's good. And He's always good. And He's going to be good to me. And He's going to be good to you. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. The Word of God is powerful. It is so very powerful. I'm so thankful for it. Thankful for this tremendous story today. King Hezekiah's testimony from going through tough times in his life, he said, wow, it was a great thing for me. I learned so much about myself. I learned so much about the Lord, and I learned that God is good. God is good to me, and all things work together for good. For peace, I had bitterness. He had bitterness of soul, but now he's got peace. Wow. What a testimony. That's, that needs to be our testimony. When we have bitterness of soul, anguish of soul, God wants to give us peace. Peace. If you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you need to be saved today. We want you to step out and come to the front. We can show you from God's Word how you can be saved. If God's led you to join Hope Baptist Church. We'd love to talk to you about that today as well. Father, I thank you for your Word again. Thank you for the power of it. Bless this invitation in Jesus' name.